Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is the third lesson of our three lesson series in the circulatory system. Uh, first, we just talked about, in chapter 18, we talked about blood. Chapter 19 was involved with the heart. And today I'm going to talk about chapter 20, which are blood vessels uh, and the rest of the circulatory system. Okay, now, probably the reason I like studying the circulatory system is because of my engineering background. The heart is a pump. Uh, the blood vessels are tubes that carry blood through the body, away from the heart to all of the cells in the body, and then bring, back it back, bring the blood back to the heart and so on and so forth. Uh, with a side trip to the lungs. And it all seems to make pretty good sense. So, hopefully you have, ha you have already seen the list of figures and tables that I gave you to get printed, as well as the study guide that is on the page 798. Always your author starts the first section of the chapter with some very general information. And this section 20.1 is titled General Anatomy of Blood Vessels. There are three principal categories of blood vessels. Arteries, veins, and capillaries. Arteries are by definition, uh, the vessels that carry blood away from the heart. Veins carry blood back to the heart, and the capillaries are in between the arteries and veins. They are microscopic, and this is where uh, most of the products in the blood are transmitted back and forth to the tissue and back into the bloodstream. First, if you will look, well not first, but next, if you will look at the figure 20.2 uh, that's on page 746, we can talk about the three layers or tunics as they're called of arteries and veins. This is an important point and might be a good test question. All arteries and veins are composed of the same three layers, believe it or not. But they are uh, obviously different thicknesses in uh, different blood vessels depending on the purpose of that blood vessel. The tunica interna sometimes called tunica intima, lines the inside of the blood vessel that is actually exposed to the blood. It consists of a very simple layer of endothelium. Um, the middle layer is called the tunica media and is the thickest. This layer is, it has blood, collagen, in some cases, other elastic tissue. This allows the blood vessels to constrict and then again to relax. The tunica externa is the outermost layer. It, it consists of just loose connective tissue uh, that holds everything together. Let's talk now about arteries. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. They have, they have to uh, be able to endure a higher pressure inside their walls, so they are, in general, thicker and stronger. They are also called sometimes resistant vessels of the cardiovascular system because of this strong, resi resilient tissue structure. Now, there are three different classes of arteries. Uh, 
basically starting with the largest going down to the smallest. The first class are the conducting arteries, also called the elastic or the large arteries. Examples are the aorta, the common carotid, uh, subclavian arteries, pulmonary trunk, etc. These just carry blood and are able to sustain a large internal pressure. You will see uh, examples of these also in chapter 20 or in figure 20.2. On the right hand side, the large connective artery and then the distributing or muscular or medium artery. These are a little a bit smaller branches and these branch off of the aorta, for example, and distribute blood uh, to other specific organs. Finally, there are very small arteries and there are innumerable one of this sort and these sometimes are called arterioles. Sometimes you can see them uh, with the naked eye, sometimes it requires a microscope. Now for some reason, I'll go along with your author right now, he discusses arterial sense organs probably because these sense organs are found in some of the larger and the medium arteries, uh, mostly medium arteries. Your author says that certain major arteries above the heart, superior to the heart, have sensory structures in their walls that can monitor blood pressure and chemistry of the bloodstream. They transmit that information to the brain stem and then uh, using uh, efferent, or efferent neurons can then make changes to the cardiovascular system. There are three different uh, types of sense organs pictured in figure 20.3 on page 747. These are carotid sinuses, and these are, which are baroreceptors. They can sense uh, blood pressure. Carotid bodies are found near the, bran or near the branch of the common carotid arteries, um, and they are chemoreceptors that can, that can monitor different changes in blood composition such as pH, oxygen, and carbon dioxide levels. Then there are also aortic bodies, and these are chemoreceptors as well. Now, after we, we have now discussed the three different branch types of arteries, let's discuss capillaries. These, by definition, are all microscopic. And this is where all of the transmission back and forth of nutrients, wastes, hormones, uh, red and white blood cells takes place through the walls of these capillaries. There are three different types of capillaries. You can see in figures 20.4, 20.5, and 20.6. 20.4 shows an example of a continuous capillary. Uh, and these occur in most of the tissues in the body, such as skeletal muscle. You can see and sense there that uh, nothing is able to... Uh, slip through and out of the capillary uh, at that point, except in a very small intercellular cleft. Type 2, figure 20.5, is a fenestrated capillary. And here there are various different pores, filtration pores, 
and intercellular clefts that allow uh, different molecules, even red blood cells and white blood cells, to pass out of the in and out of the capillary. Finally, there are sinusoids. These are found in the liver, bone marrow, spleen, and a few other organs. These are shown in figure 20.6. Let me now briefly discuss capillary beds. Capillaries are organized into web-like networks that are called capillary beds. And they may have two, three, five, up to as many as a hundred capillaries that are supplied by a single arteriole. Uh, if you look at figure 20.7, uh, you will see some capillary beds that are between an arteriole and a venule. Continuing on, we'll talk about veins. Veins are called capacitance vessels of the cardiovascular system. These, in general, are subject to much, much lower pressures than our arteries, and they have much thin, thinner walls, and they're very flaccid. So they can expand quite a lot and hold a lot of uh, extra blood. If you look at figure 20.8, you will see that in a, quote, resting adult, unquote, that almost two-thirds of the blood is found in veins at any instant. These veins can expand to hold blood if it's not needed at that instant, and then uh, can be uh, forced to contract if blood is needed. There are, uh, your author breaks down the types of veins now into five categories. Let me do it in reverse, then he's done it. There are first the large veins, such as the uh, inferior and superior uh, veins that flow into the right atrium, the pulmonary veins, uh, internal jugular veins, these are quite large. Then uh, there are venous sinuses. These have extremely thin walls and large lumens, have no muscle in them at all. There, they are examples of these are the coronary sinus of the heart and the dural sinuses of the brain. Medium veins are the ones in the middle, if you will, up to about 10 millimeters in diameter. These carry uh, and hold a tremendous amount of blood at any one instant. And something else that is very, very important is that these medium veins are uh, primarily responsible for being able to help move blood uphill out of the legs and the pelvis and return it to the heart uh, through the vena cava. Um, we'll talk about venous valves briefly and a little bit later in the chapter. These valves allow blood to flow uphill towards the heart and then not to be able uh, to go backwards uh, again once the valves close. Then there are muscular venules and postcapillary venules. These are the smallest types of veins. Okay, section 20.2, we'll talk about blood pressure, resistance to blood flow, and blood flow itself. Oop, I have a cat screaming. 
That's one that screams because it's hungry all the time. Here's another statement from your author. To sustain life, the, the circulatory system must be able to deliver oxygen and nutrients to the tissues and then remove the wastes at a rate that keeps pace with tissue metabolism. Now, the blood flow to a tissue can be expressed in terms of flow and perfusion. Flow and perfusion. Definition. Flow is the amount of blood in milliliters usually that flows through an organ or a blood vessel or a tissue in a given amount of time, such as milliliters per minute. Perfusion is the flow per given volume or mass of tissue. It is milliliters per minute, that's the flow, per gram of organ or tissue. These are two things that I want you to learn the definition of. There's a lot of physics involved in this, again, but I will not bore you with my knowledge and love of physics. Let's talk about blood pressure. We all know that we have blood pressure. Uh, figure 20.10 shows a, a very nice graph uh, of systemic blood pressure in millimeters of mercury in different areas of the body, in different uh, uh, arteries, veins, if you will, increasing distances from the left ventricle. The aorta at its uh, inflow has the exact same blood pressure as the left ventricle, here shown at about 120 over 80. And then this blood pressure diminishes as the distance increases from uh, the left ventricle. You also see that the uh, pressures in the capillaries, venules, and veins are very small in comparison to the pressures in the arteries. I also want you to know the definition of pulse pressure. Pulse pressure is strictly the difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressure at any one point in the circulatory system. For example, in the left ventricle, if the pressures are 120 systolic and 80 diastolic, the pulse pressure is the difference, which would be 40 millimeters of mercury. Another measure of the strain on the blood vessels is called mean arterial pressure. Mean, if you have ever studied statistics, is more of an average. Now, there is no, we do not have any gauge that we can wrap around an arm or leg to measure mean pressure, mean arterial pressure. But a very good uh, approximation is by, you can approximate the mean arterial pressure by taking the diastolic pressure and adding to it the pulse pressure divided by three. Okay? It shows an example there on the left-hand column of page 753 for blood pressure of 120 over 75. The mean arterial pressure is the diastolic pressure, 75, plus the uh, 
pulse pressure, which is 45, the difference between systolic and diastolic, divided by 3. And that gives you a mean arterial pressure of 90. Now, why do we bother with this? The next paragraph tells you that it is this mean arterial pressure that most influences uh, the risk of problems in our body, such as fainting, uh, atherosclerosis, swelling, kidney failure, etc. And now, even though this is a course in um, normal anatomy and physiology, your author likes to discuss very briefly some of the disorders, the problems. He talks about arteriosclerosis, which is an increasing stiffness of the arteries that occurs in old people like me. It's called, sometimes called hardening of the arteries. These arteries cannot expand and contract as well. Those of us who might also have heart disease have another factor called atherosclerosis. This is a condition uh, in which lipid deposits, mostly cholesterol, occur in the arterial walls. If right now you will skip um, to page 739 back in chapter 19, you will see uh, a buildup of lipid, lipid deposits in a coronary artery. There is another condition that's very, very common in this country called hypertension or high blood pressure. And that is defined as a persistent, persistent if measured several times, systolic pressure greater than 140 or 145, depending on who you read, or a persistent diastolic pressure of 90 or 95 when measured several times. We also may be bothered by hypotension, and this is a chronic, not just a one-time thing, but a chronic low resting blood pressure. And this can cause problems if we have sustained blood loss, uh, dehydration, and, or anemia. There are other conditions that can cause very momentary increases or decreases in blood pressure. Uh, but we won't study those in this course. Okay, I want you to skip now. Oop, nip, poo, yep, skip now to page 756. And let's see how blood pressure and blood flow can be regulated by our own body. There is both local control of pressure and flow as well as neural control that involves the central nervous system. Local control is also called autoregulation, and this is the ability of tissues to regulate their own blood supply. Um, according to the metabolic theory of autoregulation, if an organ is metabolic, is inadequately perfused metabolically, or it becomes hypoxic and waste products accumulate, then there are local factors that stimulate the blood vessel to dilate and the blood flow to increase. And this will help then to uh, maintain homeostasis. There's also neural control. And we, when we studied uh, the arteries just superior to the heart just a moment ago, we talked about several of these centers. 
there is the uh, vasomotor center that is very important, and it's located in the medulla oblongata of the brain stem, and it exerts sympathetic control through the sympathetic nervous system over blood vessels throughout the body. Uh, this center receives information from baroreflexes, chemoreflexes, and the medullary ischemic reflex in different parts of the body. The, this, uh, these nerve impulses are sent back to the vasomotor center, which then makes corrections. It can make corrections either by increasing or decreasing the heart rate, by uh, causing arteries and veins to expand or contract. Um, there is also hormonal control. And this works very well with both the local and the neural control. And I want you very briefly to look at the different hormones uh, we studied some of these briefly in chapter 17. Angiotensin II comes from the kidneys. And it is a very potent vasoconstrictor. Aldosterone comes from the adrenal glands. And it can promote sodium retention. And this also helps support blood pressure. There are natriuretic peptides secreted by uh, the heart, and they oppose the aldosterone. Antidiuretic hormone uh, promotes water retention. And then there are the catecholamines, neurotransmitters named epinephrine and norepinephrine. All of these work together to maintain homeostasis in our body and or to uh, meet our body's needs if we are uh, very sedentary or if we are very actively exercising. Section 20.3 discusses the exchange of gases and molecules, even cells, that can take place in and out of capillaries. Remember, there is this is always a two-way movement. Okay, two-way movement. The different mechanisms of movement through the capillary wall are diffusion, simple diffusion, transcytosis, filtration, and reabsorption. Diffusion is, uh, we will study in much more detail uh, later when we talk about kidneys, uh, but this is the way that blood gases such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, uh, simple molecules like uh, glucose uh, can move in and out of capillary beds. Simple diffusion. Each of these molecules or gases has a certain amount of kinetic energy due to its movement, and this helps the uh, molecule or gas particle to be able to move down its concentration gradient from areas of higher concentration to lower concentration. There is another method called transcytosis. If you look at figure 20.16, you will see on the far, at about three o'clock position in that uh, cross section of a capillary, you will see different particles uh, going into vacuoles that move to the outer uh, layer of the cell wall of the capillary, and then they are released 
into other parts of the body by the process called transcytosis. Looking now at figure 20.17 on page 761, this is a very, very busy picture showing forces of capillary filtration. This is moving out of the capillaries and reabsorption is moving particles, gases, etc., back into the capillaries and capillary beds. I will leave it up to you to go through all of the numbers there uh, if you wish. Just remember that, that these are pressures that can push things in either direction or actually pull things. Pulling things into the capillary is a process of reabsorption. All right, how does blood get back to the heart? Remember that uh, blood pressure in the arteries is very high compared to the pressure in veins. Look, reading now from section 20.4, your author describes five different mechanisms, and I want you to have heard of and read a little bit about these. One is the pressure gradient. Um, the pressure gradient is pressure generated by the heart. It is the most important force in venous flow even though, as we just said, it's much lower in veins. Still, there is a pressure there that does tend, at least, to move, thing, move blood back toward the heart. There is also gravity. One of the first things we do if a person is having significant swelling in their feet or ankles uh, or even if they've had sustained an injury, a sprained ankle, for example, we tell them to elevate the part that is swollen, elevate it above the heart level. And that allows gravity to help pull the blood back into the central circulation and to the heart. There are two different kinds of pumps that are also available. One is called the skeletal muscle pump. The veins in the legs primarily have uh, small valves in them. And when you contract the muscles, uh, in figure 20.19 shows the calf muscle. When you contract the calf muscles, blood is pushed upwards to the heart. There is a valve then in the upper part of that figure that closes when the, when the muscles relax and then the blood is not allowed to flow uh, in reverse. There are many different valves throughout the legs and some in the arms that allow us to move blood up and out of the legs and the arms if they're dangling, um, if you're taking a walk, or uh, even after surgery, when I had my knee replaced recently, I was told this is one of the very most important exercises, was just to lay in bed and contract both my uh, quadriceps muscle and my calf muscle to move that blood out of my leg up to the heart and to avoid uh, any blood clots that may try to form in my legs. When we breathe, there is also a pump from the different pressure in the uh, thoracic cavity that will pull blood and put pump blood up into the inferior vena cava and into the uh, right atrium. The heart also helps to move blood 
just a little bit. Okay, there's a little bit of discussion about circulatory shock. Uh, this is a state in which cardiac output is insufficient to meet the body's metabolic needs. And there are two major categories, cardiogenic, and that's caused by inadequate pumping of the heart for various reasons, or just low venous return to the, there's not enough blood in the veins to uh, move the blood uh, back up into, enough blood up into the heart. You, I would like you briefly to look at those. Briefly also to look at sections 20.5 titled Special Circulatory Routes. Um, 20.6 is a very short section on the anatomy of the pulmonary circuit. This can get a little bit complicated unless you study it a little with a little detail. Remember the basics, that arteries carry blood away from the heart. Usually arteries have a large supply of oxygen as they leave the heart and go to the rest of the systemic circulation. But the uh, pulmonary trunk that leaves the right ventricle is an artery because it's leaving the heart going to the lungs. That's why it's pictured in red as an artery. It breaks up into various different art, smaller arteries. Um, and then the veins carry blood back to, once they've been oxygenated, the veins carry this blood now back to the left atrium so that it can be moved through the remainder of the body. Um, small picture B shows the beautiful little capillary beds that surround each and every alveoli in the lungs. And these are responsible for taking up oxygen and giving up carbon dioxide so that it can be uh, released. Two more figures that I want you to look at. Hopefully you have printed. Figure 20.21, page 768, shows the primary and largest systemic arteries of the body. I want you to understand and be able to pick some of these names off a well, off of a diagram on the test. And then figure 20.22, page 769, is a, uh, is a figure showing the major and largest systemic veins in the body. Also go through and memorize the biggest and most important veins. The remainder of chapter 20 goes through in great, great, great detail all of the other arteries and veins of the body. Um, I am not going to lecture through these, nor do I expect you to memorize these unless, as I said, you have been blessed with a photographic memory. Um, yes, I had to learn these when I went to medical school. But remember, you are not at this moment in medical school. So you do not have to memorize all of this. I am going to end now with this, uh, from this chapter 20. I know it's been a long discussion. You probably want to look at this in a couple of different parts. 
thank you for those of you who have given me your attention.